Hey, 42 here. In 1274, legendary Mongol leader Kublai Khan, grandson of the even more legendary Genghis Khan, gathered 30,000 men and set sail for Japan. Anyone who's visited the land of the rising sun will know it's a beautiful country. But this was no sightseeing tour. It was an invasion. Embarking from South Korea, the waterborne Mongol horde quickly conquered the Japanese islands of Tsushima and Iki. But after landing at Hakata Bay on Kyushu, the invaders met with fierce resistance from the local samurai. Kublai Khan was forced to temporarily retreat, but as his men hopped back into their ships to regroup, an enormous typhoon engulfed the fleet, sinking some 200 vessels and effectively ending the invasion. It was a huge setback, but Kublai Khan was a man who was used to getting what he wanted. And so, rather than giving up on his dreams of conquering Japan, he spent the following seven years rebuilding his forces to take a second bite at the cherry blossom. In 1281, the Mongols were ready to set sail once more, and this time the fleet was even bigger and better than ever before. With close to 4,500 ships and 140,000 men, Kublai Khan's Mongol fleet 2.0 would remain the largest invasion force ever assembled until the D-Day landings of World War II, 663 years later. Historians aren't exactly sure how many Japanese soldiers were on hand to defend against a renewed Mongol assault, but most estimates suggest they were outnumbered by more than three to one. In other words, they didn't stand a chance. And yet, if you happen to be a history buff, you'll know that the Mongols never conquered Japan. And the reason for that is simple. Just when it looked like the entire Japanese archipelago was about to come under Mongol management, another monstrous typhoon battered the Great Khan's fleet. This time, the results were even more devastating. No more than a few hundred of the four and a half thousand ships survived, and tens of thousands of men were drowned. Many of those lucky enough to survive washed up on the shores of Japan, where they were swiftly executed by the locals. Despite the twin defeats of the man they should probably have called Kublai can't conquer Japan to save his life, it was clear things would have been very different if it were not for those two timely tempests. In fact, the timing of the typhoons was so impeccable, from a Japanese perspective, that many suspected a higher power may have been involved. Which is why the great typhoons of 1274 and 1281 came to be known as the Divine Winds, or in Japanese, the Kamikaze. Recently, Magic Mind got in touch with me to ask if I'd like to try their mental performance shots. Considering I spend most of my day trying to be as productive as possible, I jumped at the chance. So now, I've been having a Magic Mind shot each day for the past five days. And honestly, guys, these things have transformed my work and everything besides. Magic Mind improves focus and reduces stress with the inclusion of 13 active natural ingredients, including matcha with L-theanine, which smooths out your brain's caffeine response so you don't get jitters. Even if you drink coffee with Magic Mind, which you totally should, because now you just get a nice steady flow of energy which lasts longer than just drinking coffee alone. There are nootropics such as Bacopa and Monieri that supports attention and cognitive processing, and adaptogens such as ashwagandha that helps reduce stress and anxiety. You get the most effect from Magic Mind after taking it for 10 days, so I'm really excited to see how I feel then, but from day one of taking my first Magic Mind, I felt an instant change in my mind and body. I was just able to enter flow state much easier than ever before. Over 200 scientific studies are behind every ingredient, and the matcha tea in this is the highest possible grade. There is no risk. Magic Mind will refund 100% for 100 days after buying. So head to www.magicmind.com 40, the link's in the description, and using code 40 gets you up to 56% off your first subscription for the next 10 days. A big thanks to Magic Mind for supporting this video.
That word is no doubt familiar to you, because well over half a millennium after Kublai Khan failed to add Japan to the Mongol Empire's already impressive country collection, the Japanese once again found themselves facing down a fearsome enemy in the form of the USA during the Second World War. Once again, things were looking grim, and with no handy typhoons around to save the day this time, Emperor Hirohito sanctioned the use of a terrifying new tactic in an effort to turn the tide of the war. On the 25th of October 1944, the Japanese used suicide aircraft against the US Navy for the very first time. In order to give his pilots a little extra incentive to hop into the cockpit for the final flight of their lives, the Emperor gave them a new name. Invoking the divine winds of old that once saved Japan against impossible odds, he called them Kamikaze. Japan's use of suicide attacks during the Second World War is common knowledge, so much so that the word kamikaze, meaning reckless or self-destructive, is now firmly a part of the English language. But whilst the word is common parlance, it's been largely forgotten that Japanese kamikaze tactics involved much more than just aeroplanes. In fact, they included everything from piloted torpedoes to suicide scuba divers and human landmines. These bizarre and horrifying weapons all saw action towards the tail end of the war, rewriting the rules of engagement and redefining the lengths a country will go to in order to win. This is the story of what became known as the Japanese attack units, the most extreme weapons ever devised by man. At the start of the Second World War, Japan's Air Force was one of the largest and most technologically advanced on the planet, enjoying air superiority over almost every battlefield. But that all changed on the 4th of June, 1942, when the Battle of Midway kicked off. By the time the fighting was over, three days later, the balance of power in the Pacific theater had shifted irrevocably. The Japanese attempt to seize the strategically important Midway Atoll was supposed to deal the US fleet a major blow whilst also offering a staging point from which to attack Pearl Harbor again. Unfortunately for the Japanese, American cryptanalysts had intercepted and decrypted communications pertaining to the attack, and so they knew it was coming. Which is why, when the Japanese fleet arrived for what was supposed to be a surprise attack, they were met by a significantly more surprising and absolutely devastating counter-attack from the full force of the US military. In the space of just three days, the Japanese lost all four aircraft carriers they'd committed to the assault, along with almost 250 aircraft. Even more important was the loss of life. More than 3,000 Japanese military personnel died during the battle, including the majority of their most experienced pilots and air crews. And that posed a bit of a problem. You see, accurately dropping bombs on enemy ships from the air with World War II era equipment was, to put it mildly, a little bit tricky. Crashing a plane directly into a ship, on the other hand, well, that was a fair bit simpler. Yeah, you can see where this is going. Japanese High Command ultimately decided that airborne suicide attacks represented the maximum destruction possible given the increasingly limited resources available to them after Midway. The most bang for their book, so to speak. It was brutal, almost unfathomable to throw lives away like that. But there was a certain chilling logic to the idea. Japanese kamikaze pilots were almost all rookies, most of whom simply didn't have the skills to be effective on traditional bombing runs. At the same time, many of the planes used were old and outdated and therefore largely useless in traditional combat. In other words, in the eyes of those in charge, both planes and pilots were low value assets that had the potential to take down high value targets. Not all the planes involved were past their best. The Japanese also developed purpose-built kamikazes, including the infamous Yokosuka MXY-7 Oka, 
which was essentially just a big bomb with wings and an engine. The MXY-7 had an extremely short range, so it was flown to the drop site, slung beneath a larger bomber of some kind, before being dropped on the Allied ships below. Almost 4,000 kamikaze pilots were deployed during the Second World War. And even though only about one in five actually hit its target, collectively, they took more than 7,000 enemy personnel with them to their graves. They also sunk at least 34 ships and severely damaged several hundred others. Submarines played an important role in the Second World War, sinking literally thousands of ships and terrorizing supply lines throughout the conflict. The sub's main weapon, the torpedo, was extremely deadly, but it was also highly inaccurate, especially at range. Basic homing technology was already under development during the war, but it was still highly unreliable. And as the kamikaze had already proven, at least to the Japanese anyway, cheaper and more effective homing tech already existed, a human pilot. In February 1944, Japanese military engineers began working on a weapon called a kaiten, roughly translating to heaven shaker. The design couldn't have been simpler. It was essentially just a regular torpedo with a small compartment added in the middle. That compartment, as you've no doubt already guessed, was for the pilot. That's right, the Japanese put pilots inside torpedoes. Those unlucky men had a hand-cranked periscope, some basic controls, and an even more basic mission brief. Find the nearest enemy ship and crash into it, triggering the detonation of the Khitan's half-ton warhead. In principle, the Khitan were no different to kamikaze aircraft, though somehow I find the idea even more disturbing. But there was one small flaw in the weapon's design that rendered them more of a liability than an asset. Unlike regular torpedoes, many of which were fired from torpedo tubes, the Khitan's extra size meant it had to be lashed to the deck of the submarine that carried it. The trouble was, the Khitan had a significantly lower maximum dive depth than your average Japanese submarine meaning that until the weapon was launched, the sub had to stay near the surface, and obviously that made it vulnerable. Kitan Man's torpedo sank at least three enemy ships and damaged several others in the final months of the war, leading to the loss of about 200 Allied lives. But thanks to the glaring dive depth issues, at least eight subs carrying Kitan were sunk in the process, costing almost a thousand Japanese lives. Despite the mixed success, or should that be near total failure, of the Khitan, Japanese engineers built on the idea by designing a fully-fledged submarine version known as the Kairyu, or Sea Dragon in Japanese. They did love a fancy name, didn't they? Anyway, each Kairyu had a two-man crew and carried two torpedoes, regular, not suicidal ones, which could be fired before the sub itself, which was packed with explosives, was rammed into a nearby ship. Over 750 Kaiyu were planned to be built in 1945, as the Japanese leaned into the whole unconventional warfare thing. But only 210 had been completed by the time the Japanese surrendered in August 1945, and none of them ever saw action. As things went from bad to worse for the Japanese in the latter part of the war, it eventually became clear that victory wasn't just extremely unlikely, it was all but impossible. The Allies were making gains across the Pacific theater, and like Kublai Khan, they were soon drawing up a plan to invade Japan. That plan was known as Operation Downfall, and had it actually gone ahead before the Japanese surrendered, it would have been the largest amphibious landing in history, bigger even than D-Day. An invasion force of that kind of scale is hard to keep quiet, and the Japanese knew full well it was coming. And before the atomic bombs at Hiroshima and Nagasaki forced their surrender, they had been busy preparing to defend their shores. For the most part, those preparations took the form that you would expect. Troops were gathered, positions were entrenched, and shore-based weapon batteries were trained on the seas. But as well as their usual stuff, the Japanese also came up with something new. And when I say new, I actually mean mental. Scuba divers 
carrying mines. Known as Fukuryu, or crouching dragons, naturally, these kamikaze frogmen were knitted out in full diving gear and given enough air to survive on the bottom for about 10 hours. For weapons, they each carried a 15 kilogram mine on the end of a five meter bamboo pole. The brief was simple. After waiting for a suitable enemy landing craft to sail overhead, the crouching dragons would live up to their name and shout, Fukuryu, then unleash their hidden mines ramming them into the underside of the vessel, destroying both it and them, and hopefully not setting off a kind of human mind chain reaction all along the shoreline. Despite the fact that the whole idea of suicide scuba is absolutely bloody insane, the Japanese plan to train 6,000 crouching dragons to defend their homeland, though in the end only 1,200 or so were ready for deployment by the time of the Japanese surrender. While much of the fighting in the Pacific theater took place either at sea or above it, there was also plenty of combat on land. And it was there that the Japanese forces found themselves utterly outgunned by heavily armored American tanks like the legendary M4 Sherman. The Japanese equivalents were simply no match and so they needed to find another way of combating the apparently impervious American armor. By this point of the war, it's pretty much the case of, if in doubt, make a new suicide weapon. And so that's exactly what they did. And that weapon was the lunge mine. In many ways, the lunge mine was similar to the weapon of the Fukuryu, a long stick with an armor piercing mine on the end. But a soldier carrying a lunge mine didn't have the benefit of being hidden away beneath the ocean. Instead, he was expected to carry out the equivalent of a solo bayonet charge against a tank in the unlikely event that he arrived at his target in one piece, the mine would explode on impact, taking the tank and the lunge miner with it. Lunge mines were used against American armor during the final stages of the war, but perhaps unsurprisingly, there are no records of any tanks actually being destroyed by one. That general level of ineffectiveness is a bit of a theme here. Kamikaze planes aside, it's fair to say that most of the special attack units failed to do any meaningful damage to the Allies. Failed to do any meaningful physical damage, that is. Psychological damage, on the other hand? Well, that was a different story. It's hard to imagine what it must have felt like to stand on the deck of a warship as enemy planes rained down from above. But there are reports that Allied gunners were so frightened of kamikaze attacks that, on occasion, they panicked and fired on their own planes as they returned from bombing runs against the Japanese. There's something truly horrifying, isn't there, in an enemy who is so determined to kill you that he would gladly sacrifice his own life to do so. And many veterans were left traumatized by what they witnessed. Although, having said that, it's actually a bit of a myth that the Japanese gladly sacrificed their lives at all. It's certainly true that Japanese culture and traditions made such suicide attacks possible where they may not have been in the West. But there were plenty of people within the Japanese military who disagreed with the approach entirely. And many soldiers actively avoided selection or tried to avoid it at all costs when it was thrust upon them. And most of those that did actually volunteer did so because of a combination of coercion and mass peer pressure. Ultimately, most of them had very little choice. For the part that he played in their creation and deployment, Japanese Admiral Takajiro Onishi is sometimes referred to as the father of kamikaze. The day after Japan's unconditional surrender to the Allies, Onishi committed suicide by cutting his own abdomen with a knife in a ritual known as seppuku. He left behind a note apologizing to the approximately 4,000 pilots he had sent to their deaths during the war. Those committing seppuku typically use a kaishakunin, an individual appointed to behead the victim after they make the initial fatal cut in order to minimize unnecessary suffering. As penance for his actions, Onishi did not do this. He died of his injuries 15 hours later. The story of the kamikaze 
had finally come full circle. Thanks for watching. And guys, don't forget to check out Magic Mind at www.magicmind.com slash 42 and use my code 40 to get up to 56% off your first subscription for the next 10 days. Don't miss out.